welcome. I think people should start be, could be joining now to get started in just a moment. Chris, how's the weather where you are? Uh, pretty nice, although there's some some gale force winds out there. I'm in Connecticut, but it is uh, sunny. Take that. That's great. I'm in KC and the sun is shining. I think we're finally through. You threw it. You know, if anyone's in the chat, if they want to add where their location is in the chat, if anyone's on board here yet. Bronze, where are you located? Tampa, Florida. Tampa, okay. Yes, great weather warm. outside. It's amazing. How about you, Cindy? We are in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. Again, nothing wrong with beautiful Florida weather right now. It's not uh, diabolically hot yet. Uh, depends on your definition of diabolical. It's getting <laughs> diabolically hot. Definitely starting to pick up down there. Yeah. And Shannon, are you in Miami or Fort Lauderdale? So our office is in Miami, right next to the airport. Right. Okay. Uh, but I'm currently in Manhattan, so. Okay, fun, fun. Shannon has similar weather that I have. It's been nice this week up here. I'm just not used to wearing New York clothes, so it's a little warmer than I expect. Yeah, it's been... It's been pretty hot lately. If folks are just joining, we'll be getting going in just a moment, just giving it a little time to get our attendance in here. <clears throat> Any attendees want to share where they're located in the chat? I won't be able to hear you, but I can see what you type. Uh, Tucson, Arizona. What a beautiful place. Milwaukee, LA, and I guess that's Los Angeles and not uh, Louisiana. <laughs> but it could be. I like both spots. Chicago. Welcome, welcome. Ooh, Nash, Vegas. Nice. Maybe Nick is from Nashville. Maybe he'll be hitting a bachelorette party after this. <laughs> right. All right. Um, I think there'll probably be some folks that continue to uh, to trickle in, but I think we can maybe get started with our introductions. All right. So everybody, thanks so much for joining us. Uh, welcome to the the restaurants. The Restaurant Experience Reset uh, Roundtable here. It's brought to you by Merge. My name is uh, Chris Hunt. I'm uh, a VP of Strategy here at Merge and will serve as the moderator today. Very excited to be joined by an esteemed set of panelists uh, from some of the best brands in the casual dining and QSR industry. Um, before we dig in, I, I'd like to introduce you to our guests and let you know some of their backgrounds. Uh, first, we have uh, Cindy Syracuse. Uh, Cindy, if you want to give a little wave. Uh, she's the CMO of two very fast-growing casual dining brands in BurgerFi and Anthony's Coal-Fired Pizza, two great, delicious establishments that if you haven't tried them yet, you really have to. Uh, but Cindy's restaurant experience is, is very deep. She also This also includes Burger King, Bob Evans, and TGI Fridays. We're uh, super happy to have her here. 
Thank you. Very happy to be here. Great. Um, next, we have Nicole Turner, EVP of Client Services here at Merge. Uh, Nicole leads the consumer practice area and our Kansas City office. She has experience that spans consumer and restaurant brands like Sonic, America's Drive-In, Marco's Pizza, Casey's General Stores, LG, and T-Mobile. Uh, welcome, Nicole. Thanks. Uh, our next guest, guest comes from a place I know you've tried. Uh, Shannon Stowers is the Vice President of Media and Social Media at Subway. Prior to Subway, Shannon was at both Bloomin Brands and Yum Brands, having worked on big names as Carabas, Bonefish Grill, Flemings, Long John Silvers, and one of my personal favorites, A&W. And last but not least, we have Bronze Major, who's currently at Bloomin Brands. He's there now, and he's the head of marketing for Carabas Italian Grill. His restaurant and food brand experience also includes Outback Steakhouse, Bonefish Grill, and public supermarkets. Welcome, Bronze. Thank you. So we're very lucky to have them here together today to discuss the, the ever-changing restaurant space. Uh, so over the last few years, definitely during the, this current time, what seems like a bit of an economic roller coaster, inflation, uncertainty, and everything, consumer habits are, are shifting as rapidly as ever. The food service industry is finding itself at the midst of, of a restaurant experience reset. And hint, that's the, the name of this webinar. Uh, so we seem to be entering a new era that's really laser focused on, on customer experience. So it's just a few quick examples of, of some big changes that have impacted the way we need to present ourselves to our customers. Traffic still remains down across the industry and there's a need to expand our storefront through digital, non-traditional methods. Uh, in fact, the storefront itself is evolving as brands pursue new formats, unique growth strategies and locations. Places like universities and airports and food halls are now suddenly um, as important as maybe uh, Main Street. And the way we as customers order has even shifted dr drastically. Consider that the McDonald's app was downloaded about 40 million times last year, or how TikTok is now just as important of a channel as any other. According to some research from MGH, approximately 52 million diners across all different generations have visited a restaurant or ordered food after seeing a TikTok video. And, and now they're traveling farther away and they're paying even more really just to try this place that they saw on TikTok. Or on the opposite end of that spectrum, there's actually a lot of people that are traveling a lot less. Uh, with remote working, it's really still quite prevalent. In the New York Times, um, I just saw that office space is averaging about 48% full. And so this big drop in commuters is, is causing a decrease in daytime traffic and restaurants need to rethink breakfast and lunch and, uh, and just change kind of their overall strategy when it comes to that daytime. And these are just, just a few examples of how the landscape is evolving. Today, we, we want to take the time to reflect upon some of these changes made over the last few years and, and reassess which restaurant models and approaches will keep hold and which ones might lose some relevance. So today, we're, we're going to ask our well-qualified here, panelists here to help take a look at a handful of some of these notable shifts in the industry and determine what might be permanent or what might be a passing fab. Uh, they'll have a moment to vote if the trend is here to stay or destined to fade away. And then we'll ask them to weigh in on their reasoning for their thoughts. So that's an, enough out of me. Um, I'm going to uh, get a little bit of insight here from our panelists. So the first trend we're going to talk about uh, is the, it's starting with the on-site experience and discuss how the dining footprints themselves are evolving. So take Popeyes for an example. Before 2020, they were averaging about 75 seats per location, but now they average about 25. Uh, or looking at some place like Sweet Green, the a bulk of their new locations are really just focusing on pickup or delivery or drive-through. And across the country, there's increases in outdoor dining or curbside touchless pickup. This has resulted in a very different looking experience on site for restaurant goers. Do we think the new 2023 footprint is here to stay, this smaller in dining, more takeout, more drive-through, or is that maybe going to go away or change to something different? How does it affect being able to tell the brand story? 
So we're going to ask the panelists to vote here. Is it a, is it a here to stay or is it potentially fading away? Starting with Nicole. I think it's definitely here to stay. Okay, Cindy. Here to stay. Bronze. Here to stay with, with a caveat, but here to stay. Okay. <laughs> I'll get to that in a moment. And then Shannon, what do you think? I, I think it's not only here to stay. I think it's just the new normal. Okay. So Shannon, tell me a little bit more. What, how, how is this the new normal? Um, why do you think it's here to stay? So a couple of reasons. One, I mean, Subway, first of all, is a little bit different than the rest of our competitors in the QSR world because we are not drive-through dependent. We, you know, very small percentage of our restaurants actually have drive-throughs. So you know, with these changes, it's definitely been a challenge for us, but we spent the last couple of years really looking at what is the right way to really solve the heart of the problem, which is deliver our product more conveniently and easily, more easily to our consumers. So we've been exploring everything uh, from different footprints, you know, some that are drive-through only, so walk-up type restaurants. We have uh, our kiosks that you've probably seen in some of the, you know, airports and stuff that are actually vending machines. Uh, we've also just been trying to really deliver our product different. Um, our Subway series we introduced for a couple of reasons, one of which is it's much easier to order. And when you can't solve the actual footprint, just make it easier for them to get the product. So that's one of the things we've been looking at and then really changing the footprint, some of how we actually execute the footprint where there's maybe dedicated areas for people to pick up food that are ordering either through third party or first party um, or just wanting to pick up through the app. So we've really been approaching it from a number of different fronts and internationally growth is a big piece for us. And each market has their own dynamic needs. You know, you go to a lot of places in the UK, they want very different type of interaction than you may see in Singapore or Australia or South Korea. So we've really been attacking it a lot of different fronts, um, which is why, again, I think it's only here to stay, but it is just the new normal. Do you think speed is, is the big biggest driver I, here? I think it's both speed and convenience. Um, people just aren't willing to do what they used to do. I mean, I think we all probably remember if you go back 10, 15 years, it was not a big deal to show up at a casual dining restaurant and have an hour or 90 minute wait. People don't really want to do that anymore. Um, they're just, their lives have gotten too busy and they're not willing to do those types of things. So it's really just solving convenience for them and making it easier for them to get your product. Bronze, what do you think? You said you had a bit of a caveat there. What do you, what do you think is going to be potentially sticking around and what's going to be going away? You know, Shannon kind of hit on it. He said it's the new normal, and I agree. It's the new normal until there's a newer normal, right? right. Uh, the medium in which customers enjoy our food and service does not dictate the experience. What remains is high level of service, great food, craveability, and experience that drives frequency, right? So it's important to listen to the customer and their needs, and that will really dictate our business model. So it's less about whether it's here to stay or not. But again, I think for the foreseeable future, it absolutely is here to stay, but it's more important to ensure that our business models are agile enough so that when the customer starts to change, we can change with them or get a little bit ahead of them. So that was my caveat. You, you see, foresee any changes uh, in the coming months or the coming year? Not that soon, not that soon. When I look at our growth strategy, right now we do have a smaller footprint. So for the foreseeable future, absolutely, it will be a smaller footprint. Um, but you know, nothing is ever permanent in this industry. We've been working in the restaurant industry for a very, very long time. So when the customer does change, we just need to be prepared to change with them. Cindy, well, on that, go ahead. Real quick, is that, you know, it's, it's interesting, and if anyone's seen kind of what's been going on at Subway. Our CEO, John Chipsy, talks very well about that's what, exactly what happened to us at Subway. We basically let the world change around us and we didn't evolve. And, you know, it led to some, you know, some negative impacts over the years, which is what's driving all of our change now, because Brian hit on a very key point is customers going to change. You have to change with them. Mm -hmm. Cindy, what do, what do you think? Any specific changes impacting uh, BurgerFi or Anthony's or just so in general? Smaller, but evolving, right? That would be my caveat. So for our chains, for BurgerFi, it's a made to order experience, right? So the you still expect it in um, a quick, great, 
hot food service, but you're also, just as the way Starbucks came in with the third space where people wanted a place to sit down, while we see smaller footprints, we also see that our consumers that want to dine in are coming back and dining in. They want that time, whether it's shared with their family or a break, whatever it might be. We're just also seeing shifts. So for instance, in Anthony's, um, where uh, we have a new lunch that we're rolling out and we've seen the shift to Friday, Saturday, Sunday, where people want to spend, they're not, they are working from home and they want that interaction. And it's, now it's just shifted to the weekend. So as marketers, it's always our responsibility to deliver what the consumers want when they want it. And shame Absolutely. on us if we're not on that trend and evolving. But it's, you know, it's trickier in the real estate. So how do you look to manage that? And for us, we manage it by location because we're not as large as say Subway. We're looking at that, really evaluating that location. And if it's suburban, if it's um, uh, an airport location, if whatever it might be, making sure you have the experience uh, that you're designed to match that experience. Mm. Well, are there any uh, specific changes that you've implemented that you have made a huge difference where you feel like they've helped with growth or helped with customer service? Uh, oh, absolutely. You know, for pizza, you're always, you're ready for takeout, right? It's always been a large part of our business for Anthony's. So at BurgerFi, uh, adjusting and setting up takeout because it wasn't designed as takeout that's been, uh, was initially a challenge and one that we've solved positively for. So how, how do you create operationally as well as marketing the packaging? And I think Shannon said it earlier, making sure you're delivering the quality of your product to meet the expectations, right? And how fast it gets to them, you know, is, a, is another subject. But pizza's been delivered in a, uh, on a hot box since the beginning of time. So what is your expectation? Your expectation is that I get it the way I want it, right? And customize it and everything else that's accompanied with it. But we still see a lot of pickup. Have, the cha- have you felt like you've had to juggle two totally different sets of changes uh, on site for the burger side and the pizza side? Yeah, the changes are definitely uh, different on, uh, for one versus the other, where where the product is made to um, go. And then, you know, the challenges when you put in delivery as someone who's worked um, for many years in the burger world, the idea of delivering fries, you know, 15, 20 years ago was a third rail, couldn't be done. And consumers are willing, you know, now getting that right packaging and how you're placing those orders and delivering it to them. The expectation is completely different from the consumers. My adult children are very happy to heat up microwave fries and heat them up all night long, right? Which operationally would kill me, but right (laughs) there, my Gen Zers are, are totally fine with it. So again, back to the theme of, when the the consumer's expectation changes, you must change with it or get in front of it. Ideally get in front of it. Nicole, what do you think? How how do you think it might evolve? One of the things that we've learned about the modern consumer is that they're expecting seamless and custom and personalized over extravagant. So creating a memorable brand experience doesn't necessarily have to equal grand anymore. You can approach environmental design with a modern and digital lens and brand cues can really be more immersive than ever. So it's easier to please customers in a a store environment than it used to be. And, And so it's easier to achieve with that smaller footprint. And the modern customer isn't really expecting as much as they used to. Yeah, for sure. Okay. Any, any other, anything to add just on the overall footprint or, or where things might eventually go? Um, because I, I think the next trend I, is sort of part of that a potential evolution. All right. I think a great design experience is always a great design experience, right? So design theory in of itself tells you to design to what the consumer wants and the consumer will return 
and pay you back for it. Well, and you, you hit on a really good point there too, is like talking about the experience and what you portray yourself to the consumer. So uh, before taking on this role, I was leading insights for Subway. And during our kind of all of our research to figure out how to, how to improve the brand, we did a lot of blinded and branded uh, product testing. And, you know, I won't say some of these specific numbers, but I will say that when we put our products head to head against the competitors in a blinded environment, we're parity to better. If we expose the brand name, we would lose some preference because of historical biases around, you know, the exposure of our meats and, you know, sometimes not, you know, having the, the, the most efficient and best looking garden. But that's why, you know, to, to have one point, it's getting ahead of some of those things that we've got to deliver the better experience that is, you know, uh, representative of your product. Mm. Love that. I agree. All right, I'm going to keep us moving along, um, but just kind of still continuing to think about how that experience changes a little bit. So physical experience has undergone significant evolution. The digital experience is always changing, uh, and maybe if not by more. Uh, let's take a look at how home technology may have impacted our, our customer journeys. So apps, they're now table stakes for brands. <clears throat> Consumers have come to expect them. Uh, from restaurant brands, it, but that increased customer adoption and usage, brands are using the data they capture more effectively and they're able to personalize experiences uh, or they're able to improve service. Uh, for example, Chick-fil-A has begun to track app order location by the device to prioritize orders in the kitchen and have been able to cut wait time down by one or two minutes. This added value actually is felt by the customer and often results in, in more app engagement. It's, it's expected that over the next couple of years that, that over half of QSR sales might actually be projected to be digital rather than in person. There's a, a lot of shift happening here. Um, when we look at the app that's going to be driving a lot of that, is, is that going to be a primary ordering and engagement tool for restaurants? Is, is this... Is this something key for brands going forward and an essential tool? Uh, what do we think? Is this, is the app prevalence here to stay or is that something that might fade to something else? Uh, start with Bronze. I think it absolutely is here to stay. Okay, Shannon. Uh, definitely here to stay and I'll use Bronze's answer until the next new normal comes along. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, Cindy. Yeah, here to stay, always evolving. Okay. Nicole, what do you think? Definitely here to stay. All right. Tell me a little more. I think um, apps will certainly remain a primary ordering and engagement tool. And when we talk about the role of the app in the customer journey, we really look at it as a virtual storefront that's in the palm of your hands. So the customers, like we just talked about in the previous topic, are continuing to really expect this fr frictionless experience. And there's such an opportunity to weave in personalization using first party data through account or loyalty information and really get the customer to their purchase or end result faster. So that's the ultimate goal is to connect them with their desired result as fast as we possibly can. And through access to an app, you can now do that digitally. Um, the last thing I would say about it is gamification and engagement within the app is such a great way to build a relationship through moments of surprise and delight and really showcase the personality of the brand. So it opens up a whole world of possibility to engage with the customer once they leave the spot where they started with you, whether it's in the store or whether it's from their couch. So to really create moments of engagement and proactive communication can all now be done through your mobile device, which is in everyone's pocket. Read. Yeah, it, so do I. And, and Bronze, what do you think? How, how are you leveraging the app? Is, is there a, a way that it's improving your experience, the customer experience? So I think having an app in the marketing world would be at the base level of Maslow's hierarchy of needs yeah. if he created <laughs> one for marketing. So I absolutely believe it's here to say, you know, at Carabas, we are very digital first and we pride ourselves on that. And we actually took a step back and we took down our app. So it's not available right now because we wanted to re-engineer it and get it right. So we've done tremendous work 
to get our app in the right place. We want to have a seamless customer and consumer experience. experience and we're actually relaunching it for Carabas in Q3 of this year. But there are several benefits to having an app. And, you know, Nicole hit on a <clears> lot <throat> of, them. you know, one, just access to first party data. It provides another channel to communicate with your customer and it drives sales and traffic and hopefully frequency too. And you really can customize the experience and offers, which further builds connectivity and loyalty to your brand. But most importantly, you give the decision-making power to the consumer. So how much or how little they interact with you via the app also gives you information so that you can customize some of your messaging, offers, push notifications. There's just a lot of power in it when done right. What what types of engagements are you prioritizing in this uh, 2.0? One, we just want to meet the customer where they are, you know, when we look at their purchasing habits and when their data, we really want to customize offers for them, really build that connectivity with the brand and just build that loyalty and affinity for Carabas because it is such a great product. And for those who love it, we want them to come along the journey with us. Yeah. You bring up an interesting point around the engage, having an engaging app because especially younger people, you know, they keep their phones clean like they do probably better than their rooms. But you're competing for real estate on their phones for these apps. And we see consistently people will actually delete a restaurant app until they want to use it again. And then they'll put it back on. It's very hard to really earn that space on their phone for your app. And, you know, that engagement piece is, is massively important if you're actually going to earn that real estate on their phones. That's right. That's right. Yeah. What's uh, Subway trying to do to make it a little bit stickier? So we've been consistently reworking our app, uh, doing more and more stuff. We have an entire team, obviously, that uh, really leverages that, continuously trying to improve our loyalty program, our usability on the app, um, simple things that, you know, that make life easier, like our your, your order tracker. So if something comes along, you know, taking out the pizza and Uber playbooks, you can see where it's going. Uh, a lot of things just to really drive that usability. Um, the app's a bit of a blessing and a curse for Subway because the reality is it's you're almost never more than a mile from a subway. So it's very easy to just run in and get one. Uh, and you often don't need the app. So it works both ways for us. Cause on one hand, it's great that we're everywhere. On the other hand, to Bronze's point on getting first party data, we're a little slower out of the gate because of that. How about you, Cindy, when it comes to the, the first party data side, how are you, how are you able to leverage it to this point? It's, it's one of those things where everybody's really able to collect the data there's but not everybody's been able to really put it into action quite yet it's it's a, a big undertaking right what that's the key like it, right yeah. that's the key is yep. what do you do with it so um at burgerfy while there's not nearly as many footprints as um other brands right and certainly as shannon has uh finding it um, and understanding where you want to go, but we call a burger fries, right? Our fanatics. So if you are craving that burger, you're going to go out of your way to get it. So we reward our loyalty members with unique experiences, like a secret menu. You can only order off the secret menu if you're a loyalty member. And we change that secret menu um, quite often without any notice, except for our loyalty members, we'll let them know in advance. So, right, advance notice, advance orders, um, and perks and benefits that they get only as a loyalty member. So to Shannon's point, you got to earn that real estate, right? So if you're going to earn that real estate, what am I going to get special extra? And by the way, that's a value to the consumer because you can put things on, but if it's not a value to them, it's not gonna earn the real estate. So that's where we spend a lot of time and feedback and we survey and have direct contact with our loyalty members. So they are, they choose and sometimes design the secret menu items, right? What do they want? And as well as team members, because if you ever worked in a restaurant, the people who know what the best thing is is the people who work in it every day because they've made a special combination or right? they don't want to eat it every day the same way. And those recipes are often the best hidden secret. So we allow our team members along with our consumers 
to develop those ideas and showcase them. Well, Cindy, I think that I'm going to have to go back to my app development team and tell them that they need to add a secret menu <laughs> just for the app. So thank you for that. Yeah. And you just talk to your GMs and I'll tell you, I guarantee you they're making different dishes that are not on your menu and tweaking them. I found that at Fridays too, right? They're like, no, we don't make the, the sizzle dish like this. We make it like this because we eat it every day. Right. Mm -hmm. And then putting that on the secret menu, same things with Anthony's that, and that's the next piece that we're going to launch for Anthony's there's items that we still make that have come off the menu, but that are favorites. So secret menu, if you want, right. If you want the sauce the other way, it's a bambini pizza. You just type that into the, to the results and it'll come that way. I love well, a secret that's menu. That's a great idea. Great yeah. idea. In restaurant, we do have five items that are, are a part of our secret menu. We don't advertise it. We don't talk about it. Right. That's a great thought process. What would it look like if you were to extend that to the app experience? Because that's another benefit that the user gets that everyone else doesn't necessarily know about. That's awesome. Right. So, Bronze, I have to ask, what's your favorite crop and secret menu item? Oh, man, there's so many, but I will let you discover it when you download the app. Nice. <laughs> great strong, answer. Strong, strong answer. Uh, so help me help me understand because it's a bit of an oxymoron getting the word out about a secret menu, but how do you, how does the word get out about the secret menu? It has menu? to be word of mouth by your consumers, right? What's it's not like? the marketing department. Right. It's discovery. Oh. And yeah, it actually it. led one of our secret menu items was a patty melt, but we didn't have it. So right was hosting the buns upside down in a different way, which led to the launch that we just have now of a traditional Texas toast patty melt and doing mm. a classic and rodeo burger. So it was such a popular team member item, right? It's really taking the insight. So I don't need to push the marketing. Again, I'm designing for the consumer. The insight was there. They voted for it. They wanted it. Give the people what they want and then right. see how it goes from there. And it was existing it items, right? So operationally, it wasn't com complex. It was all made out of existing items combined a different way. Yeah. And that's another great benefit is that is a great incubator for new innovation. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. And now are you, are, how are you coming up with the items? Is that also, are you leveraging the data for that? Leveraging the data, looking to see what, um, but again, we survey, we ask, we actively engage. Mm -hmm. And you'll also find that on TikTok, right? Like even when it, or, or is it, we went on the chat, someone said, Cindy, what's your uh, salad dressing for Anthony's? Guess what? I'm going to post a video and I'm going to show you what the red wine simple uh, uh, salad, the vinaigrette is for Anthony's. I'm happy to share it. You can buy it in the Anthony's, but people want it and, it and it grows loyalty. If you give people what they ask for, they're not still, they actually will come back right? And engage with you. So that engagement and that incubation, we take a lot of inspiration from the social channels as well, right? And how we're engaging on uh, TikTok and other channels. But okay. they'll tell you, people want to tell, if they love your brand, they want to tell you and they want to engage. Okay. Bronze, what, same? Are you going out on, on TikTok and social and, and whatever sort of orders are coming in? So I, I agree with Cindy. I think sometimes from a marketing standpoint, it's so easy to get caught up on like what we're doing from like a digital perspective and, and research and insights, which are all great. But at the end of the day, there's so much power in word of mouth and really listening to the people who have their feet on the street. So that's your operators in, their, in the restaurant, like just getting feedback from them. How are the customers interacting with the dishes? What are, their, what are they changing? Are there customizations? Um, absolutely, social media um, are, are two ways that we really listen, and, and that voice carries. And to Shannon's point, it really helps us with innovation. Okay, this this and might we're grittier. We're grittier founder brands, right? I've worked in big brands, and I've done it mm -hmm. both ways. Mm -hmm. But and I'm also an operator. So when you have one store, right, you learn how to listen, and you learn how to be gritty and get her done. And it just, it, the, the evolution, all these things coming together of social media and being able to listen really is a benefit to us as restaurant operators because it's, it, I want data. 
But yeah. now my guests and my most loyal guests can get that data to me in many ways quicker than ever than me setting up a formal post study and consumer intercept. You can post, you can have a consumer intercept in two hours posting something online. That's yeah. right. And it's, it's amazing. You guys both hit on one I think, key point there that the trust and authenticity to the guest, especially the Gen Z, these younger, they can smell, they can sniff bull out in a second. And if they feel like they're being marketed at, they will just ignore you. Mm -hmm. So then this might be a loaded question. How do you, how do you organize and analyze all that unstructured social data and review data as it's coming, it's coming in so much of it? How, how do you get it to a point where it's usable? Well, you can still, you, no, go ahead, Cindy. We, we, so we take those ideas and then you still can go into screening, right? So you, you, you take the ideas, what do we have? And then you can concept it many times. We'll put it in a, because we have company restaurants. I'll put it in a couple of company restaurants and sell, see what it does, right? Like just put it out there and see what it does or concept screen it, then go in, concept it, see how it scores to understand and then make tweets. That's exactly right. Got it. All right. Any, anything else to add really around the, the whole the whole topic of, you know, leveraging the app, leveraging the data um, to, to really try to build up that experience. Chris, the one thing I was going to add is that um, I think that e even from this recent conversation, there's still so much to learn. So we're gathering so many insights within the app itself. And with social listening, it gives us a really good emotional quotient to put behind it, which is amazing. So then we can go back and validate it. So instead of the app, instead of the here to stay or go away, it's definitely here to stay, but it's going to continue to get so much more immersive. Mm -hmm. And there's so many opportunities to connect it directly to social. So I think there, um, there are so many opportunities ahead for us to really bring in the culture of the brand into the app. Whereas right now it started as a functional tool. Right. So that's, that's ultimately where I see it going is um, being more of an emotional cultural driver, um, similar to what socials become. Yeah. And I think it's just going to keep continuing because to your point, even beyond social, you know, with connected TV and addressable TV and all these different streaming platforms that are getting more and more integrated through first party data, you know, you know, the hope would be at some point we can all communicate to every consumer with the exact right message, with the exact right product, which is probably a ways away from us still, but um, it's improving every day. All right. Uh, okay, great. Uh, well, we've had a lot of agreement so far. I mean, we need a little dissension in here, maybe. Uh, <laughs> one other major trend. Separate questions. <laughs> well, let's see. Uh, so one, one other major trend that has really blasted off in the last few years is the use of the third-party operated delivery services, 3PO's. I've also heard 3PD's. But the Grubhub's, the DoorDash's, the Uber Eats of the world. Uh, usages of these apps increased quite a bit in 2020. And while they've leveled off a little bit, there's still a bit of a necessary evil for the restaurant businesses, uh, despite some pain points like customer service challenges or the fees. How can we best partner with the 3PO brands uh, to ensure everyone wins, including the customer? Is their prevalence here to stay or maybe are they perhaps destined to fade a little bit? So what do you think, Cindy? Here to stay, fade away? Well, uh, I would say in its current in incarnation, there is fading happening already. Okay. So this is a business model that took off um, during COVID while at the, at the expense of many small restaurants, right? That went out of business. So as a, a service that's built on the backs of restaurants, um, they must understand, and this is where there can be some dissension, no, no model is ever um, completely bulletproof. And you're seeing that now because guess what? They have to provide service. We're their clients. The customers are their clients. I use it all the time. And if you can't meet the service level, the same thing will happen. And I think that's the opportunity and partnering, partnering means sharing data, developing promotions. It doesn't mean uh, keep raising fees 
and only selling me incremental ad spends. Mm-hmm. Because, right? So as a brand, I say, I, listen, I'm going to stand up and say, you need to partner with us because it just gets passed through to the consumer. So if we can't provide a benefit in the service, there will be another that comes and finds a better way. Okay. Bronze, what do you think? How, how's it impacting you? Is it, is it bright um, future or... <laughs> I, I know some people think of this as a necessary evil and in a lot of ways it is. I choose to think about it as like the power of the and with the customer being at the center of that they get to enjoy our incredible food in the restaurant and at home if they want. I think third-party delivery service isn't going anywhere. Again, it might evolve, but it did keep a lot of our businesses alive during COVID. Future State, I think it's about collaborating and creating a sustainable business model for them, us, and the customer, which Cindy kind of hit on. You know, it's really about that collaboration, sharing. Um, There's going to be a point where you can't keep raising your fees because that does flow through to the customer and the customer won't necessarily be using your service at the same rate. You know, here at Carabas, we have multiple calls with Uber Eats, Grubhub and DoorDash a month. And at the center of that really is being, you know, developing a solutions oriented approach of ensuring that the partnership works for all of us. So there's a lot of give and take. Sometimes there's a little bit more give than take, but, um, you know, we are figuring that out because we do realize that third party is an essential part. And right now it is a cornerstone of our business. So I think in, in, in the short term, it is here to stay again, it may evolve, but, um, you know, the consumer has voted with their wallet and they've said right now in this environment, they're willing to pay, pay a premium. But we know as we continue to see shifts in the macroeconomic environment in terms of inflation and cost of living, discretionary income does become a scarcity. So your fees can only increase so much. Uh, We can only pass that through so much. So it's really that partnership and collaboration and consistently talking so that we can make sure the consumer wins is the only way that we as a restaurant company wins and then the third party delivery services win as well. Exactly. I think what, one thing you have to keep in mind, too, is it's a little bit different. So if a consumer were to order off the Subway app or go to, you know, to Carabas.com and order or go to, to Bertify's website and order, they've already selected your brand. So they're using your menu of food versus if they go to their Uber Eats app, they're looking for a menu of restaurants. So, you know, there's That's a right. unique opportunity to get your brand in front of consumers when they're in a different uh, need state. You know, they're not they haven't already opted into your brand. So I think it's something that I agree with what you guys are saying completely that it's going to ebb and flow. I think with competition will bring, you know, decreasing, decreasing prices. Uh, one casual dining brand I worked on back in the day, we were, we tried to fight, fight it for a long time. We tried to do first party delivery and we, it was very hard because you're adding labor that's sitting around a lot of times and you were adding a lot of complexity to the business and with competition came lower, you know, rates and we abandoned it. So I think it's going to ebb and flow and it'll, with competition, it'll find its middle ground. Nicole, what do you think? I think it's here to stay, but with different operating parameters. So it's, it's right now demanding a change. And that is something that needs to be heard. And I think it eventually it will be. And with the right types of partnership, there's beauty in co-branded collaborations and making sure that the product is delivered to the customer in a very quality manner um, and really bringing the brand to life in the right ways. But it's really hard to do that right now because of the way the market is with the three POs. So that doesn't exist yet, um, but that would be the ideal state is to get to a place where um, some of those partnerships can work under better parameters. um, And there are two sides to the story. Right now, I think it's very one-sided. I completely agree. Do we think there are any optimizations on the horizon? Let's hope so. <laughs> I do think that there's some, you know, recently we had a call with uh, Uber Eats or actually it was, they were here on site and we talked about the integration of our loyalty program into the Uber Eats experience. So if a consumer were to order via Uber Eats, they could still get the benefit um, that's associated with our loyalty program. 
but again, um, you know, the conversation is going in the direction of information sharing and making sure that we can um, get all of the benefits associated with that. So that's an ongoing conversation, but there is definitely innovation in the pipeline um, that so this so that the consumer can win. But we want to win too. Right. <laughs> but it can be a win-win, right? That's the goal. Right. It needs to be. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and then we get, we're gonna have we got one more trend to uh, to dive into here. Uh, we're gonna move to scannable technology and the the QR code. Uh, it is the QR code that we thought was maybe going away a decade ago, but it is now back in full force. Uh, menus and scannable experiences. Uh, it really became a safety precaution for a touchless experience, but it's evolved into commonplace to help create frictionless experiences for customers from purchase to in-dining engagement to loyalty sign-up. According to Statista, actually, over half of all restaurants are using QR codes currently. Uh, so it, it, it's it's very well in place at the moment. Uh, is, is the QR code actually here to stay now, or, or is this something, the scannable technology, is uh, is there going to be a new phase of that? Um, starting with uh, Shannon. I think when we say here to stay, I would say here to stay for now. I think we don't know what the next thing is. AI is going to bring new stuff along. Everyone else, you know, there's going to be some new technology. We just don't know. So I think it's here for now. Okay. How about you, Bronze? Uh, I agree with Shannon. Here to stay, dot, 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 for now. <laughs> Nicole? I think scannable technology is here to stay. Um, I don't know if it needs to be a QR code, but I think being able to quickly access from your device with scannable technology is here to stay. Cindy, where do you think it's headed? Here to stay, and as a marketer, um, I think the challenge is, are you doing everything you can to leverage it? Mm -hmm. Because it is a great content device. So the best way to engage with your brand and people that want to engage is right there, right? Whether you're sitting with a bag at your desk at lunch, whether you're at the restaurant, however it might be, you have to choose a wine and you're waiting for your waiter. Oh, here, take a scan and see uh, the incredible Sicilian house wine and how we make it. Oh, I had no idea this was, this is how you made that wine. Wow, I wanna try that. So people are always seeking information. I, I do everything from, I wanna know, different QR codes at different points in the restaurant, different interaction, track that data, understand how they use it, and then content, 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 right? Because mm -hmm. content for a marketer is, I always say content is king and distribution is queen, right? The best way to create brand love is to let people fall in love with you. What is it about my brand that you don't know, at, right? And let me tell you about it. So as a marketer, um, and I do think that's a place where AI can help enhance the QR code or in helping you create content. I don't need um, seven, seven freelance writers, right? I have content that I'm using on my blog that I'm repurposing and understanding and how I can create content that is always feeding and is new because posting it and putting it up for 12 weeks is a no-go. So if you're gonna provide content, that content has to be refreshed and you have to be ready to go with it. So to me, right. it's an exciting way to deliver content where consumers want it. Yeah, are you getting, how's the engagement? Are you getting in, a lot of engagement with the content? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you would, Things that you wouldn't know that I can't put in a 30 second commercial, 15 second digital ad, right? We have no freezers at Anthony's. What does that mean? That means everything is made fresh, scratch daily. Think about that. No freezers, right? There's not a lot of restaurants. You'd be like, that, that's crazy talk. But that's mm -hmm. how Anthony developed the restaurant and those recipes. So there's quality cues and stories that people discover on their own, I'm not making an ad about that. We usually tell about the rational differences. But when you discover that, you think, huh, 
you know, that's why it tastes better or different or why I'm willing to pay more or why I'm willing to go out of my way or why I'm coming every Sunday after church to Anthony. So giving those brand attributes that everything cannot fit into an ad, as we all know, and we've all been charged to do. This allows for discovery and back to an earlier content that, I mean, comment that Shannon made is um, consumers want authentic content. So if they discover it and you meet the expectation, they will reward you with the visit. How are, Shannon, how are you using this cannibal technology? Similar, similar ways, different way? So we have not... I don't think we fully leverage the scalable technology as much as we should, to be honest. Um, we still, I think for the most part, it's still a functional tool that they use to see a menu or to do this. We haven't quite bridged as far yet as Cindy was talking about of really using it to drive engagement through content. And I think that's an opportunity that we still have uh, to get ahead of. How about you, Bronze? Uh, same with Carabas. Um, you know, it really was and still is a very functional tool to Shannon's point, but there is development and innovation so that we can fully leverage it. So, for example, every month we have a wine dinner, but there's innovation in that we are starting to create a virtual wine dinner experience. And part of that is leveraging a QR code. So you and for your friends could be at home having the wine dinner experience with wine that we provide, great food that we provide, but it's curated via like a QR code or, or something like that. So that's, hap that's happening. You know, Cindy talked a lot about brand love, you know, giving people a reason to love your brand. So we're having conversations of how do we leverage that for um, some videos and user user generated content so that we can, you know, um, continue to leverage our brand advocates. And then also Carabas has a rich history. We're not a company that was, you know, founded by corporate guys. We have authentic Sicilian roots. So really leveraging that technology to tell the rich history of our dishes, which are very authentic, um, you know, telling stories of our founders and their family and how they migrated from Italy, settled in uh, Bryan, Texas. And we have, you know, a signature dish on the menu uh, called Chicken Brian, which really marries the, the, the Southern cuisine of like Texas and then also the Sicilian roots. So there's so much rich storytelling that can happen via use of scannable technology. And it's absolutely one of our priorities this year to make sure that we start leveraging it. And if you ever want to see someone that is just made for the camera that creates human engagement, it is Johnny Caraba. He, right. he, was made, he is made for the camera. So absolutely so it definitely is another touch point to bring our in restaurant experience to life yeah. tell our brand story and build a deeper connection with the customer um and we'd be crazy if we don't leverage this more often all right nicole what do you think How, where does the opportunity lie i well first of all i completely agree with the creating immersive experience component because through content you can build so much culture um, and and really convey it to customers, new customers and loyal customers. That's super important too, is to keep feeding the loyal customers additional content so they crave more. Um, I think the trick is to use the scannable technology thoughtfully and how to create the proper calls to action. So are you asking them, are you providing uh, a scannable QR code for purchase? Or are you creating engagement? Because sometimes they just want a faster experience. And sometimes they want to spend more time with the brand. That's really hard to delineate between the two. And so the smarter we get about that, I think the more effective we'll be. And the one thing we haven't talked about much that I think will be um, a huge opportunity is through media with um, tech, with new outlets like pause ads. So being able to pause and use scannable technology to engage with the brand from your own home as a new customer is going to further connect the entire experience. Um, so I think it's definitely here to stay. Our big challenge is that people are going to become somewhat numb to it because they expect it everywhere. So how do we engage them in the right ways to get them connected, to pay attention and really um, build that bond in that relationship? Yeah, so definitely. Going to bring that storytelling together with the technology. Exactly. Well said. All right. Uh, any other any other final thoughts on the scannable technology? 
And so we're, the, we're clearly going through a reset to the experience uh, with many emerging innovations sure to follow. Are there are there any big trends that we that we neglected to talk about? I know there's kind of the big elephant in the room around AI, but that's probably a whole nother uh, webinar uh, topic for just to focus on. So it, I, what are your thoughts in the little bit of time that we have left? What other trend, do you, big trend do you see on the horizon? Uh, we I talked think, a lot of, about ahead, content friends. and there was one question in the chat that says, curious how you've changed your way of working to deliver content and photography. Okay. What do you think? So I can jump in on one thing. It, it, yeah. So we're making massive changes because we, you know, we're leaning more heavily into social and, you know, we just onboard an entirely new social agency. We, we have are now getting ready to leverage an entirely new social strategy. And, you know, again, it goes back to just the traditional marketing days of just putting ads out is, is gone. So really getting very integrated into the consumer's lives and talking to him to them in the right places at the right time. You know, it has impacts on how you bring all your photography to life. You know, they don't want this perfectly curated, uh, you know, food stylist looking product on, on Insta or TikTok. They want to see real people eating real food. And, you know, it, but obviously we always have to take a little, little uh, creative license, but it is definitely changing the way we take our entire go-to-market approach when it comes to showing a lot of content. That's right. And I, I promise Shannon and I aren't comparing notes because we too are about to onboard a new social media agency. And if you look at Carabas on TikTok, we don't have anything because we want to make sure that once we launch, we have a sustainable plan uh, to, to make sure that we, we see it through because that's a very powerful platform. Same thing on Instagram and, and Facebook. We are present there. We do have a very healthy following, but we want to make sure that the content is consistently curated. So we did bring on a, an in-house social media manager for that. I do think that there is still a role for like the perfectly food stylist photography. That's mainly for like your menus and your website. Um, but it's really ensuring that you have a balance of both so that you are hitting the customer with the right type of photography and messaging at the right time on the right platform. Yeah, it's, I agree. It's completely channel based and, yeah. you know, and it's getting the right thing. And, and honestly, you know, bronze here and the TikTok pieces, tracking your brand's code on TikTok is no easy challenge. Really figuring out how to bring mm -hmm. it to life in the authentic way that consumers want it. Mm -hmm. It's been a, it's been a bit of a struggle for us. I think we've really just now started to get it to where we feel good, but it's, it's no easy task. So it's, it's, it's probably smart to go slow to go fast. Yep. And see. Uh, when you're a nimble startup brand, right? It's the first place I went because when you don't have paid media or right large paid media, you need to go organic in order to right. have the right. movement. So the social and content strategy was the very first thing that I did and onboarded um, to understand and make big leaps. We weren't on Twitter. On Anthony's at all, like start a post, right? Like start and engaging with other brands as well um, is a really good way to get into the conversation. But we have a dedicated uh, strategy uh, with the targets and as well as UGC. But how are we engaging with them? And for us, I need a lot of heavy lifting as a startup. To, on the organic side, because I don't have the money on the paid side. So mm -hmm. that's how the, how we're using it to really stay competitive with, you know, larger national brands. Yeah. Which is a, a great thing about TikTok too, is it's very different than, you know, like a Facebook where if you're posting stuff, it's only being seen by your followers. TikTok right. is different. If you have great content that's engaging, it's going to get seen by a lot more people. Um, so it's a, it's a very powerful tool if you can leverage it properly. Yeah, and it brings authenticity too. Uh, okay, it's so well, nimble, we... right? For me, I love the AB, right? Try, fail, fail fast. Yeah. There's no faster way. And the beauty of it is doesn't work today. Change, edit, quick couple, I can edit it right on my phone, 
right? Boom, boom, boom. And I'll pe- post up the next version and see, oh, you know what? It's posting better with those titles like that. Yeah. Okay. Love it. Uh, well, well, we're at the hour, the top of the hour here. Uh, I, I don't know if anyone had any final parting words or something that they were just burning to get out that they didn't, but, and I'll, I'll get pause just for a moment. We all set. <laughs> Because <laughs> I, I uh, want to be respectful of everyone's time. So thank you so much for joining. Uh, Bronze, Shannon, Nicole, Cindy, it was really great to have you and and your, your tremendous insights. So thank you so much for joining. Thank you for the attendees for joining as well. Uh, hopefully you got a lot out of it. And uh, we'll hope to see you for another one of these webinars soon. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you all. See you thank later. You. Thank you. Bye.